Wasn't that a fabulous introduction to New Orleans? <laughs> Good morning and thank you. My name is Hans Gross McLaus. I am vice president, I'm vice chair, I'm the president of ARVO and vice chair of translational research at the Emory Eye Center and professor of ophthalmology and pathology at Emory University School of Medicine in, in Atlanta. For the past year, I have had the distinct honor of serving as the president of ARVO. I am also pleased to welcome you all to the historical and beautiful city of New Orleans for ARVO's 94th annual meeting. I am so pleased to see you, realizing that many of you have traveled great distances to join us today. The ARVO Annual Meeting is the world's largest global meeting for eye and vision research. After a fully virtual meeting in 2021 and a hybrid event in 2022, this year marks the return of many of our colleagues from across the globe as travel becomes more viable in this post-pandemic world. I wish a warm welcome to each and every one of you. This week, more than 8,500 scientists representing over 60 countries have made the journey to New Orleans to share the very latest in eye and vision research with one another. We will come together to foster new relationships, connect with old friends, and build new bridges of collaboration that drive innovation within the vision research community. The theme I chose for the 2023 annual meeting, the beauty and of diversity in science and nature, speaks to the mechanistic diversity in ocular disease, but also as we as vision scientists are a diverse group with multiple backgrounds and perspectives. New findings can come from unexpected places. By working with diverse individuals, both inside and outside of our scientific community, we can find new innovative ways of approaching our research and advancing the field. ARVO members and meeting attendees come from many backgrounds. Look around and you will see researchers, clinicians, clinician scientists, students, patient advocates, partners from government and other professional associations and industry all here in New Orleans together to advance vision research. ARVO has made strides this year to address the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, both in our science and our labs. In November, ARVO hold the Envisioning Equity in Eye Care Conference, which brought together experts who examine the social and environmental factors fueling disparities in eye and vision research for those who receive disparate care, particularly amongst communities of color. During the two-day conference, researchers, clinicians, and community leaders discussed ways to implement solutions. I am pleased to announce a new ARVO program that will serve as a critical element of our diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts. ARVO members who self-identify as part of a group that is un underrepresented where they live or work will be eligible to participate in a program created exclusively for them. The program focuses on underrepresented groups and will join the Women's Leadership Development Program and Global Mentorship Program as opportunities for collaboration and learning. This program will be finalized over the next 12 months and further details about participating will become available soon. There will be an open call for volunteers to develop the program details. If you are interested in being considered to serve in this capacity, watch ARVO Connect over the next few months. I am also excited to announce the launch of another new program called Setting Your Sights. This program aims, aims to motivate and guide a new generation of eye and vision researchers from around the world, especially youth from underrepresented groups by encouraging interactions with current members of the research community. These students aged 12 to 18 are being engaged through vision science mentors, advocates who will visit schools, and speakers who will share their journeys and enlighten them on various career paths. 
Additionally, lists of internships, online learning materials, contests, and more are available to encourage students to, in, to consider a career in vision science. We are excited to be launching Setting Your Sights at this meeting. The very popular professional development conference, ADVANCE, continued its third annual program on the topic of career directions. This event, held in February, explored various career directions, such as academia, industry, laboratory science, clinical science, and public health advocacy. Our members in training were provided free access to the meeting, which included a keynote address by Dr. Pat DeMori, panel discussions, resume review, and lightning talks with experts from each area. Now, I would like to share a video with you that highlights the many initiatives and activities Arvo has been working on since we last met in Denver. All of these activities serve Arvo's mission to advance worldwide research into understanding the visual sy system and preventing, treating, and curing its disorders. Now I'm very pleased to acknowledge a select group of Arvo members who made a special commitment to eye and vision research by giving their time experience, and knowledge through their work in our organization. Thank you to the ARVO members who have been named the 2023 ARVO Gold Fellows. And thank you to the ARVO Silver Fellows. Please join me in recognizing all the Arvo Gold and Silver Fellows who I invite to stand at this time. Congratulations to our newest fellows and thank you for your dedication to Arvo. 
The Arvo Foundation provides a critical opportunity to support the future of our field through financial contributions, whether it is through a travel grant, a mentorship program, or a research award, your generosity assists the Arvo Foundation in supporting scientists across the globe. Now I am pleased to welcome the chair of the Arvo Foundation for Eye Research, Dr. Joel Schumann. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Uh, welcome everyone once again to the great city of New Orleans. My name is Joel Schumann. I'm a glaucoma clinician scientist. As of May 1st, uh, I will be the Kenneth L. Roper Endowed Chair and Vice Chair for Research Innovation at Will's Eye. Uh, I also serve proudly as the chair of the Arvo Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Arvo. The Arvo Foundation is now in its 22nd year, and it was formed to ensure Arvo's continued impact on vision scientists and on transformational discovery. We do this by raising funds to support our members through career development, education, travel support for meetings, and research grants. You will see the great work of the Arvo Foundation on display throughout the meeting. Presentations by individuals who have received prestigious awards for their research are scheduled throughout the week. You'll see hundreds of travel grant recipients here with financial support from Arvo and the Arvo Foundation. And to open and close the meeting, we are pleased to have two spectacular keynote presentations that will inspire us all. I extend our thanks to Alcon for their generous support of the Arvo Alcon keynote series, which includes today's presentation and Thursday's keynote. This year marks the 18th anniversary of Alcon's commitment to fund the keynote series, which is always one of the highlights of the Arvo annual meeting. Alcon, on behalf of the entire Arvo membership that has benefited from these remarkable presentations over the years, we thank you for your continued and generous support. I'd like to acknowledge a few additional groups of people and ask that they stand to be recognized. First, I ask all members of the Dowling Society to please stand. These, these are individuals who have committed gifts of $10,000 or more to the foundation. This includes seven new members whose names are on the screen who were inducted last night at the Arvo Foundation Gala. We're grateful for their commitment to Arvo and to vision research. Thank you. Next. I'd like to ask anyone who has contributed to the Arvo Foundation in the last year to please stand. Now, if you're not sure if you contributed to the Arvo Foundation, you can, you can look on your name badge and see a little icon in the corner that says, I give if you've made a donation in the last year. Thank you all for your generosity. Now, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our newest giving circle at the Arvo Foundation for Eye Research, the Legacy Society for Planned Giving. The Legacy Society is a committed core of members who have generously supported Arvo by designating the foundation as a beneficiary of their estate plan through a bequest, charitable trust, retirement plan rollover, or other deferred giving arrangement. We are deeply grateful for these donors whose support will serve as the cornerstone of the foundation's continued growth, ensuring we can continue to provide funding 
for research, education, and outreach initiatives for many years to come. I ask you to consider being part of this important opportunity. Your gifts, large or small, are critical to our mission. We have just seen who supports our work. Now, let's see who benefits from the generosity of the Arvo members. We have some of our recent award recipients here with us today. With the recipients of the following awards, please stand when your award is called, and I ask that the audience hold your applause until all the awards have been called. First, the Dr. David L. Epstein Award. Second, the Genentech Career Development Award for underrepresented minority emerging vision scientists. The Arvo Foundation Collaborative Research Fellowships. The Pfizer Ophthalmics Carl Camrys Translational Research Awards. The Bert M. Glazer MD Award for Innovative Research in Retina. The Kreisig Award for Excellence in Retinal Research. The Oberdorfer Award for Low Vision Research. The Point of View Award, the Ludwig von Salman Clinician Scientist Award, the I Find Research Grants, and the Arvo Foundation Early Career Clinician Scientist Research Awards. Congratulations to you all. <laughs> Next, if you received a travel grant to attend this meeting, please stand and remain standing. All travel grant awardees, please stand. The people you see are the future of our field. It's through the generosity of our funders that more than 400 men and women can attend this meeting to share their science, find new collaborators, and ultimately advance in their vision scientist careers. 69 of the individuals who just stood here thanks to the generosity of Arvo activities, uh, Arvo attendees last year in Denver who gave to the matching gift campaign. You can again support researchers through our special matching gift campaign this year. Arvo member Don Hood has issued a challenge to all attendees here this week. For every dollar you give, he will match your gift up to $25,000. Thank you, Don. Our campaign goal is $50,000. You can make your gift in person at the Arvo Central in the exhibit hall, online, or by using the donate button on your Arvo 2023 app. You can take your phone out now <laughs> and press the donate button on the app. Please give generously, as you've just seen firsthand, the faces of the people who will benefit from your support. Our sincere thank you to Dr. Hood for this generous match. Let's meet this challenge and bring more young researchers to Seattle next year. And thank you for all your support of the Arvo Foundation. I welcome back Hans Gross-Niklaus, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. I hope you will consider being part of our matching gift campaign 
No contribution is too big or too small. Each dollar truly makes a difference for our early career scientists. The Arvo Elkhan keynote lectures bring some of the brightest and most highly accomplished scientists in the world to the Arvo annual meeting to help us think more broadly about science and to inspire us in our own work. This morning, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, who is the senior group leader at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Research Campus. She is a founding member of the Neuronal Cell Biology Program at Janelia. Dr. Lippincott Schwartz obtained her MS from Stanford University and obtained her PhD in biochemistry from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Lippincott Schwartz has pioneered the use of green pro, uh, fluorescent protein technology for quantitative analysis and modeling of intracellular protein traffic and organelle dynamics in live cells and embryos. Her innovative techniques to label, image, quantify, and model specific live cell protein populations and track their fate have provided vital tools used throughout the research community. Her own findings using these techniques have reshaped thinking about the biogenesis, function, targeting, and maintenance of various subcellular organelles and macromolecular complexes and their crosstalk with regulators of the cell cycle, metabolism, aging, and cell fate determination. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society of Arts and Sciences, and the European Molecular Biology Organization. She is also a fellow of the Biophysical Society, the Royal Microscopical Society, and the American Society of Cell Biology. Please join me in welcoming this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz to Arvo 2023. Thanks very much, Hans, for that really nice introduction. I am very excited and pleased uh, to be talking to you today. Um, my first experience with Arvo scientists, uh, i.e. scientists involved in vision research, was when I was a graduate student. Uh, in fact, it was Arvo scientists like you who saved my vision. Um, I was rotating through an organic chemistry lab, as we all did as biochemistry PhD students, and a, a big vat of acetic anhydride uh, that was boiling went right into my face and burned the epithelial layer off my eyes. Um, I, was I was rushed to Hopkins Hospital where I experienced unbelievable care um, and uh, you know, just amazing treatment uh, by the eye, scient the, the, uh, eye researchers uh, at Hopkins. It, and it was ever since then that I really appreciated what you all do for uh, really humanity, um, not just people who are you know, fighting you know, a particular disease, but people who just have accidents like myself as a small little graduate student. Anyway, my eyes are perfectly fine now and I am delighted to be talking to you. So um, I'm gonna be talking about cells and what they look like uh, with new imaging technologies. And um, I really wanna emphasize that um, although uh, everyone here is ultimately really focused on this absolutely spectacular organ, the eye, um, all organs uh, really are comprised of cells that themselves are organized through organelles, subcellular organelles, which themselves 
are comprised of molecules. So there are different levels of biological organization, and we really need to understand these different levels and how they uh, intersect with each other if we're truly going to understand how something as beautiful uh, and complicated as the eye works. So um, let me just zoom in for the rest of the talk on organelles. And there are nine different subcellular, organelle, subcellular organelles that uh, comprise all eukaryotic cells. And this is actually quite interesting if you think about it. Every eukaryotic cell on Earth has all of these nine organelles, uh, and some have more. But these are the core organelles, uh, and you don't, you cannot become a, you cannot act as a eukaryote without them. Uh, these organelles include the ER and the Golgi that are involved in secretion, um, the endosome lysosome system that are involved in uptake and degradation of macromolecules, mitochondria that is. Uh, key for energy production, the nucleus involved in DNA replication and storage of her heritable material, the peroxisome uh, involved in detoxification, and lipid droplets in fat storage. Now, all of these organelles uh, not only um, have these discrete uh, cellular activities, but they are interacting with each other, and that's part of the themes I'm going to be talking about today. You, you don't have, a cell does not work properly um, unless these organelles are functioning properly, not only as individuals, but also as a coherent community uh, to allow the cell to function properly. Now, the strategy that my lab has taken throughout my career is to actually look at these organelles. Um, and that's why I'm so thankful that I didn't lose my eyesight when I was a graduate student, because basically I spend my time looking under microscopes uh, to visualize and analyze these organelles. And the, the, the underlying uh, sort of philosophy for this is that it's only by looking at these structures uh, that we can understand their form, which is inextricably linked to their function. So today I want to talk about three types of imaging uh, that are now possible uh, thanks to incredible developments in technology. Um, and these types of imaging encompass dynamic imaging, i.e. looking at these subcellular organelles in action, how they're communicating with each other. Structural imaging, which is looking at in ex exquisite detail the overall organization um, of these, uh, uh, of these uh, organelles. And finally, atomic level imaging uh, using uh, cryo uh, microscopy approaches to actually look at macromolecules that play a core part of building these uh, organelles. So we're going to start with dynamic imaging. Now, um, the cell, as I said, is comprised of all these different organelles. And it's only with the advent of uh, particular imaging approaches, including multispectral unmixing, that we've been able to, as seen in this movie here, seeing all of these organelles uh, moving and communicating with each other uh, simultaneously in a single cell. So what you're seeing here are uh, six different organelles that we've tagged with fluorescent probes uh, different types of fluorescent molecules that, uh, that have different spectral frequency that, of visualization. And by, uh, un, by performing a spectral unmixing approach, we can visualize all of these fluorophores without their overlapping with each other, which is what you would normally see uh, uh, because we don't have fluorophores that don't have some type of overlap but you can computationally get rid of that overlap and then visualize all of these different uh, fluorescent probes tagged to these organelles simultaneously to get insight into uh, these structures. Now, we acquired this with a lattice light sheet microscope, which um, basically slices through the entire cell, so we have volumetric information on these organelles as well. 
So what does this type of data allow you to do? Well, it allows you to come up with um, discrete values uh, for how these organelles are operating. How many of these organelles are there per cell? Um, you can see, for instance, lipid droplets, uh, peroxisomes, you know, are roughly twice the number of, at least in that particular cell that we're seeing uh, compared to lysosomes. We can also compare the volume of these organelles um, and also look at uh, this, their speed of motion. And one of the things that I think you can see from this, these values here is that the lysosomes are moving uh, significantly faster than any other organelle within the cell. And this is illustrated in this movie here. Uh, in green are the lysosomes uh, and the the yellow, which sort of looks green in this screen here, are microtubules. So those lysosomes are moving along microtubules, and you can see that they are frequently us adhering themselves to uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, which, uh, as I'm going to show in this next movie, uh, is the most abundant organelle throughout the entire cell. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum uh, uh, acquired uh, with a um, a grazing incidence um, microscope that, that can very quickly um, acquire images so that we can see the dynamism of this elaborate tubular um, network that comprises the ER. It extends throughout the entire cell, as you can see, from the nucleus all the way out to the cell periphery. Now, interlaced within the ER are mitochondria which uh, undergo continuous fission and fusion, as you can see in this, in this movie here. Now, one of the things that was quite exciting to us when we acquired these multispectral imaging, uh, the images of all of these organelles operating simultaneously within cells, is that many of these organelles are actually contacting each other. And uh, the top panel uh, shows just little examples of these six different organelles that are color-coded and areas in the cell where you can see them come very close to each other. And if they were within one pixel, uh, pixel association with each other, we were able to define them as contacting each other. And the matrix representation uh, in the bottom part of that image is just illustrating uh, the frequency of contacts among these different organelles that we were uh, measuring. Now, why, do I, why is this contact between these organelles significant? It's significant because we now realize there's things happening at these contact sites. There are metabolites that move from one organelle to another. Um, there's lipids that traffic between one organelle and the other at these contact sites. And I'm going to be talking in just a second in more detail about these contact sites. But I just want to emphasize here that um, the greatest contact site abundance that we saw was between the ER and the mitochondria. This next slide illustrates that frequency and dynamism of interaction. To the left is a segmentation of all of the mitochondria within that cell that we were looking at. To the right are all the areas of the mitochondria where we saw the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, contacting the, the, the mitochondria. So what you can see from this is that there is a large swath of mitochondria that are, that are in intimate communication with the ER. Now, what's happening at that site is that there's calcium transfer, there's lipid transfer going on between these two organelles, which allows them to communicate with each other and modulate their activity under different conditions, starvation, stress, et cetera. Now, even though those contact sites, uh, as I showed in that live cell movie um, in the last slide, were very dynamic, if we look at them in electron microscopy as shown here, uh, you can see that they look like pretty sta stable things. They look like they're sort of a Velcro association of these two organelles with each other. But we know from the movies that I just showed you 
that this contact site is highly dynamic. We can see them form, we can see them persist uh, for up to one or two minutes, and then we see them dissipate. Uh, so how do we explain this? By EM, they look like they're static structures and anchored very tightly. By live cell imaging, they're super dynamic. So we were interested in trying to look at this in more detail, and in particular, look at the proteins that actually associate with these ER mitochondrial contact sites. These proteins form tethers with each other, um, and the most predominant tether is this VAP-B. It's an ER membrane protein that extends out into the cytoplasm and interacts with the mitochondrial protein, PTPI-51. Now, biochemistry has revealed that these, contact, these candidate proteins that um, are believed to tether the ER and mitochondria with each other um, exist, but labeling approaches, including classic sort of fluorescent microscopy approaches, uh, have not really been able to allow us to really lock into those contact sites vis-a-vis -vis these proteins. I showed you in that Lattice Light Sheet movie that we could just, from the, the spatial or orientation of these or, two organelles, define a contact site. But if you try to express any of these proteins to see them at those contact sites, you won't see it very effectively using fluorescence microscopy because there's too low signal to noise uh, or there's perturbation uh, by labeling the protein. So we wanted to know whether if we focused on this VAP-B, could we get better insight into the behavior of molecules at these contact sites, including um, molecules like VAP-B that are playing a really important anchoring role. So the way we're gonna do that is using single molecule tracking. Now, single molecule tracking is part of a technology uh, that involves super resolution imaging. Basically, you express a fluorescent protein uh, and, and instead of looking at its ensemble distribution, we're looking at individual molecules and the way that they're, they're moving. And so when we express that B, uh, you can, and do that, basically do single particle tracking of that B, you can see its rapid movement across the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum, um, as shown in this movie here. The ER is in white, in red is the mitochondria that we're visualizing with a different fluorescent protein. And all of those little trajectories that you're seeing are the path followed by single VAP-B molecules that we were able to acquire using a technology where we halo tag the VAP-B and then come in with a photoactivatable probe uh, that binds to that halo tag and then by Using photoactivation, we could switch on small individual molecules um, to track them, as shown in this movie. Now, you can see in this movie that the VAP-B diffuses very quickly all over the surface of the ER, but when it gets into the region where the ER is near the mitochondria, it's slowing down, um, or it's hovering, if you will. And this is shown in this uh, uh, movie here where um, we sort of outlined the mitochondria and uh, the three contact sites that um, I've highlighted there, uh, you can see are visited by individual VAP-B molecules that are diffusing in from the surrounding ER into regions where the ER is making these close contacts with the mitochondria. Now, one of the things that immediately uh, revealed itself from this experiment was that these contact sites are, are uh, basically molecules that are associated with these contact sites, tethering the ER and mitochondria together, are doing so in a very dynamic manner. The VAP-B is moving in and out of those contact sites every, every second, every one to two seconds. But within the contact site, it appears to be making many, many transient binding and dissociation uh, events with its binding partner, the PTPIP53. 
Now, because we can, um, at single molecule resolution, track these molecules, we can sum up their probability distributions to see at the super resolution level the contact sites. Um, and so if you look at the uh, middle image there, uh, you can see to the right of that, um, well, to the left you see the mitochondria in red with the ER, that tubular ER in, in uh, cyan. To the right are the hot spots where we see concentrations of VAPI molecules uh, due to their movement into these contact sites. So uh, those, that's the distribution of the contact sites along the surface of the mitochondria uh, in contact with the ER. Now we know that this is VAPI mediated because if we get rid of the N terminal domain of VAPI, which is responsible for interacting with a mitochondrial binding part partner, PTPI51, we no longer have any hotspots of probability di uh, distribution, as shown in that uh, middle panel there. Now, in addition to being able to define very discreetly all of these contact sites using this approach, um, we can also look at the diffusional landscape of VAPI molecules across the contact site. So to the left uh, is the localization probabilities of the VAPI molecules that we're detecting in these live cell single molecule tracking movies. Uh, you can see there's a huge density of VAPI molecules at that contact site. Now if we then look at individual molecules that are in that contact site, we can calculate, we can measure their instantaneous velocity. What's their diffusion? What's their speed of movement in that contact site? And uh, what you can see is the molecules in the periphery of the contact site are moving more quickly than the, move, than the molecules that are in the side, that the deep center of the contact site where we've color coded it. Well, it's not color, I mean, it basically indicates low diffusion. To the far right shows a uh, a graph of the localization density of these molecules that peaks in the center of the contact site with the diffusion characteristics of those molecules. So at the center of the contact site, the molecules are moving the slowest. Um, at the periphery, they start moving faster, and then they basically move out into the rest of the ER where they move very, very fast. Um, basically, we think that what this is telling us is that Base, mass action of binding of that B with its binding partner on the surface of the ER uh, creates this type of um, sort of uh, gradient of di uh, dif uh, uh, diffusion characteristics of these molecules across the contact site. Now this turns out to be really, really important in terms of characterizing these contact sites. For instance, if we look at what happens to the ER mitochondrial contact site under nutrient starvation, as shown in this, this uh, picture here, uh, this is eight hours of starvation. If we then come in and look at uh, the, the, uh, the characteristics of these contact sites using this single molecule tracking approach, you can see that they expand. The contact sites expand significantly, and that fits with, pro with other data in the field that suggests that these contact sites, um, that you really need contact sites to enlarge under starvation to facilitate uh, trafficking, lipid trafficking between the ER and mitochondria under starvation conditions. It also facilitates calcium transfer from the ER into the mitochondria, which drives oxidative uh, phosphorylation uh, within the mitochondria, ATP production. We can also see when we look at the diffusional landscape across uh, that contact site um, under starvation is that the molecules are moving even more slowly when they're in the center of that contact site under starvation conditions, suggesting there are more interaction uh, events happening uh, at the contact site under starvation. Now we can also look at what happens to these contact sites when we express a pathogenic VAPI mutant. This is a P56S mutant 
that, is, uh, uh, that gives rise to ALS, uh, a Lou Gehrig's disease, a neurodegenerative disease in humans. And what we can see when we map out the diffusion landscape of VAP-B under these conditions at these ER mitochondrial contact sites, we see multiple very low diffusion wells across the contact site. The diffusion, these low diffusion wells don't always correlate with high abundance of the VAP-B. So basically, we have a messed up contact site under these conditions. And we think that this might help give insights into what this point mutation is actually doing uh, uh, in terms of uh, disrupting these contact sites. And that, in turn, might be very Im important for understanding uh, the uh, physiological basis for uh, this disease when produced through this P56S mutation. Okay, well, I've just spent um, a few minutes talking about dynamic imaging, um, and I hope I've convinced you that uh, we've got, there's so much that can be done with, it, with these new imaging technologies um, to really look at dynamism to get insight into how these organelles are behaving and communicating with each other. I want to now move into structural imaging. And there's a new technology that uh, we've been taking advantage of at Genelia called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, which uses a combination of a focused ion beam, FIB, um, to slice or uh, continually slice um, across a specimen that will be continually uh, imaged by scanning electron microscopy. So the idea is you scan across, you uh, collect an image with SEM, and then you shave off that image to get deeper into your sample and uh, using the focused ion beam. And then you take another image with the uh, SEM. And you do this continuously to cut through the entire cell or as shown in this middle panel there, an entire tissue. Now what's really exciting about this approach is that it is isotropic. Unlike conventional serial thin sectioning EM where you have beautiful XY but your Z is like 10 to 100 times worse in resolution, with focused ion beam scanning, the XYZ is the same. Um, basically, we can get down to four or two nanometers, X, Y, Z. So it's isotropic. We can see these, we can see things equally in all three dimensions. It's large volume because we can slice continuously uh, through a whole tissue or a whole cell, and we can apply correlative approaches to find particular structures. So here's an example of a whole cell fib sim. Uh, and this is uh, really uh, through the uh, uh, innovative um, efforts of Harold Hess and Sean Zhu at, Genel at Genelia, uh, who developed this system to allow it to function over weeks, if not months. So this particular FIBSIM uh, acquisition took two weeks of continuous milling and imaging uh, through, you know, through the different sections of this HeLa cell. What it produced is spectacular data. So here's just an example of a one micron volume um, through the center of the cell. You can see the centriole. Um, but as you scroll through all of the milled images, uh, you can identify all of the organelles that, I've, uh, that you can see on the left. So we've just color-coded each of the organelles that we can beautifully identify in these images and through um, manual segmentation, you can stitch them all together to look at how all, how all these organelles are positioned relative to each other. So you can see the Golgi apparatus in orange, microtubules, uh, white, uh, the bottom is the nuclear envelope, you can see the nucleus. Now this particular one cubic volume took a single person, um, one, a, seven, a, a week, at least a week, to segment by hand. Basically, you're taking each of the image, the, each of the scanning EM images, and you're sort of outlining all of the different organelles that you see, and then you do it to the next and the next and the next. And it takes 
a week to do just one cubic micron. A whole cell is 7,000 cubic microns. So at the rate of a single person trying to do it, it would take 50 years if you wanted to segment at this level the entire cell. So what's, how do we deal with that? And at Genelia, we quickly realized that the way you deal with it is you try to create algorithms uh, that can do this automatically. Uh, basically, you build a machine learning pipeline uh, to do this automatically. And the people up to the right are people who are involved in this. Basically, we take ground truth from manual segmentations that are picked from different parts of the cell, a very small portion of the whole cell, but we feed it into a ma machine learning uh, pipeline that then can recognize, yes, that's a mitochondria, that's an ER, that's a lysosome, and uh, call it out as, we, as all of these images are stitched together. Um, we now have at Genelia a whole project team that's devoted to this. It's called COSIM, uh, most recently renamed uh, CellMap because we're now uh, interested in using these algorithms to not just look at individual cells, but whole tissue, cells within a whole tissue. Um, and it, it's a hugely powerful um, approach. This is just some of the data that you can acquire from this. Uh, basically, uh, these are four different cells, two HeLa cells, a jerkette, and a, a macrophage, uh, where all of these different organelle volumes um, have been sort of mapped out uh, and just plotted in terms of the volume representation uh, relative to the entire cell. But these data sets have huge, uh, can provide huge insights. For instance, um, previously it's been extremely difficult to look at the, uh, some organelles in their entirety. One example is the Golgi apparatus. Um, you know, there's beautiful, you know, um, transmission EM images of the Golgi apparatus. Uh, but because the, these transmission EM images uh, typically have like 90 nanometers, they're acquired through 90 nanometer Z sections, you cannot see the fine structure in Z of the Golgi, and you also don't see it through the entire cell uh, unless you uh, are able to slice through that entire cell using these transmission EM approaches, which typically is not the case. So here's the entire Golgi apparatus from that HeLa cell. Um, you can see the beautiful stacked membranes that interlace with each other through tubule connections. And you can also see the abundance of vesicles that are scattered to the periphery of this organelle. Now, not all organelles can be easily identified using this approach. Um, we were able to identify 32 different structures in this, inside the cell based on what we knew from the literature. But there are other hard to recognize structures that are out there. And so the only way you're gonna get at them uh, is by coming in with a protein tag to identify them. But a protein tag uses fluorescence, so somehow you're gonna have to correlate that fluorescence with your FibSim image, and that's not so easy. Uh, so uh, Eric Betzik and Harold Hess developed a cryostructural illumination FibSim pipeline uh, in order to accomplish that. So basically the cells that are going to be FibSim milled, um, they're prepared, they're put on a sapphire cover slip. Now because we want uh, to look at particular proteins within that cell, the cells are expressing a fluorescent molecule. In this case, they're expressing an ER probe, so we can see the endoplasmic reticulum once we put them under a microscope, a fluorescent microscope. So the cells are then high pressure frozen, uh, which is critical for this technology because um, that keeps you in a near native state and there's no chemical fixation. Um, chemical fixation can really mess up these organelles. Um, formaldehyde looks great if you're doing light microscopy, but if you look at a formaldehyde fixed cell under EM, it's bad news. So these cells are high pressure frozen, they're near native state, 
And then we keep them at that frozen temperature and look at them under a cryo structural illumination microscope to visualize the fluorescence. Um, we take a picture of that and then we put the cells into the free substitution pipeline to give EM contrast. We identify the cells that we're interested in and then we trim and in start the FibSim melt. So basically, <clears throat> we gather a block face uh, scanning EM image, and then we mill, take another picture, mill, mill, mill through, through the entire cell. So what is it that we were interested in looking at using this approach? And I wanted to show you an example of a hard to identify structure, ER, an ER exit site and an ER to Golgi transport intermediates. These are early parts of the secretory pathway. Um, this is just an, this is a movie that's gonna show you these structures. Uh, they emerge out of the endoplasmic reticulum uh, with their secretory cargo. And then transport vesicles convey them into the center of the cell where the Golgi apparatus is. Now we've known this for many, many years based on light microscopy dynamic images as shown here. But what we haven't been able to get at it is what are these tiny little structures that are moving through the cell? What do they look like um, at, the, at the EM level, at the electron microscopic level? So in order to accomplish that, um, two postdocs in the lab, really incredibly talented, Aubrey Weigel and um, Chilun Chang, uh, they're both now at other places. Aubrey's heading up uh, heads up the cell map facility at Janelia and Chilong is now at St. Jude's uh, running his own lab. But basically what they did was um, they expressed a fluorescently tagged COP2 coat protein. COP2 is part of the machinery that drives the formation of these uh, secretory trafficking intermediates. Um, and uh, what you can see in this FibSim image that has laid on top of it, the fluorescent signal from COP2 is you now can see where all the COP2 signal is in that FibSim uh, image. Now I want you to look at the small little, I wish I had a pointer, but um, the small little cube in white uh, that uh, I think you can probably see when it blows out. What we're looking at to the, um, in that little movie in the bottom right, is FibSim sectioning through that cubic volume. And what you can see is the areas precisely where the fluorescent signal from COP2 appears in all of these membranes uh, that we're slicing through. It's only because we had that fluorescent marker that we could then start reconstructing what these organelles look like. Um, and this is what they look like. Um, so these are ER exit sites where the COP2 is building a transport intermediate. Um, and so as this thing scrolls through uh, the image, you can see uh, in green the ER exit site. In blue is the endoplasmic reticulum, which is attached to that ER exit site. The red is the neck that connects the ER to that ER exit site. On average, and we looked at all of the ER exit sites defined by COP2 in our cell, and they all had a very similar morphology. Uh, they were a grape-like tubular outgrowth uh, that um, basically was about 360 nanometers in diameter uh, and 40 to 60 nanometers in each of those tubule outgrowths. Um, now we can then ask the question, of how does cargo leave the ER exit site and move to the Golgi. Uh, again, we're gonna be using FibSim reconstruction. We can release cargo from the ER and then look at map that cargo that we've expressed as a fluorescent protein uh, onto the structures uh, that we are visualizing by uh, FibSim. And this is gonna zoom in on uh, one of these guys. Uh, so here is one of these tubule carriers. Uh, this is a transport intermediate we can see based on the fluorescent signal. It's carrying fluorescent secretory cargo. 
So what does that transport intermediate look like? If we then segment out the membranes that it correlates with, you see it's a, it's a purling tubule outgrowth from the ER exit site that's highlighted in green. Now interestingly, this tubule transport intermediate is aligned with a microtubule, indicating it's moving on a microtubule. It's using motor proteins to pull itself off from that ER exit site. Um, and here's another example of this tubule transport intermediate. And this is an example where uh, we didn't transfect the cell with any type of fluorescent cargo uh, to avoid potential artifacts of overexpressing a protein. We can still see these transport intermediates because now we know what to look for. Uh, and you see these purling tubule outgrowths from these ER exit sites. So from this, uh, we've been able to sort of get a new view of these uh, early secretory uh, compartment <coughs> intermediates. Uh, basically, uh, the ER exit sites are merging uh, all across the surface of the ER uh, at sites that are defined by COP2. That, that's not new, but what's new is what these structures look like. They're not little vesicle clusters. They are a single structure, a tubal outgrowth uh, that then extends uh, along a microtubule to ultimately um, target to the Golgi apparatus. Okay, now I'm gonna go very quick through uh, the last topic, which is atomic level imaging. This is very new. Um, we're in the process of publishing this work right now. Um, it's uh, done uh, by Peter Rickauer in my lab uh, in co uh, collaboration with Winfred Denk uh, at the Max Planck. Basically, uh, our question is, can we sort of look at um, atomic level uh, structures um, using the amazing cryo-EM structures that we know uh, that comprise these macromolecular machines, and from that create some type of dynamic output of how they're operating. So the ribosome, as all of you know, uh, is a machine that is bringing together mRNA and tRNA to synthesize new proteins. Uh, this is a dynamic process in the cell. Uh, basically, tRNA that's charged with amino acid docks onto an mRNA, and then uh, you, you basically link together a polypeptide chain to create new proteins. Now, this is a field that has been around for quite a while, and, it, and it's, it's really a magnificent field. Uh, there are structures that have been acquired uh, for different steps in this process. Uh, that's what you're seeing to the right. These are individual cryo electron tomographic images of ribosomes in these different uh, uh, proposed states of this process. Um, so what we want to know is whether we can image this, these dynamics uh, in some type of atomic detail. And the approach that, that uh, we're using is called high-resolution template matching. The way this works, cells are cultured on a grid. Uh, they're vitrified. They're basically frozen um, in liquid ethane. Uh, you then acquire a single cryo-EM image. You can see that to the right. Now, when you look at that image, don't worry. You can say, well, I can't see anything. Well, even when you look at the image, uh, you know, right in front of you uh, on your computer screen, you don't see much. And the reason is, is that we're imaging with as low electron beam uh, exposure as possible so we do not destroy or interfere with the structure. Now, why do we do that? Because we're going to use a, a computational approach to pull out the ribosome. So basically, you're gonna take a high-resolution atomic model of a ribosome, you're gonna rotate it through all resolvable, resolvable orientations, and then you're gonna put it through a synthetic microscope to find the ribosome in that particular orientation. So here's the ribosome template that we're using. It's a large subunit. Uh, to the right is the simulated image of that large subunit. If we start rotating that simulated image, and see whether there's any, any, whether we can find that image in that low 
resolution structure, uh, you can actually, you get a peak. Um, I don't know if you can see the little white dot there, but that is the exact site where that large subunit of the ribosome is located in that image. Um, and you can, you can see the peak pop up in the signal to noise. Um, we're very confident that that's the orientation of that large subunit in that EM image. Um, so basically what this allows you to do is pull out uh, the 3D arrangements of ribosomes uh, throughout that entire cell that you've, or section of the cell that you've imaged. And that's shown here. Uh, in blue, we've just highlighted the ribosomes that are all associated uh, with the membrane that's clearly seen in that image. Now one of the things that's really exciting here is that uh, in addition to being able to uh, see both the small and, and large subunit of the ribosome, um, you can look at, you can see electron densities uh, that are not associated with ribosomes, uh, but represent molecules that are associated with a ribosome. And in fact, we can then come in and dock, no, dock to those electron densities known proteins uh, in the literature uh, that have been, uh, uh, whose structure has been solved, and we can see exactly how they fit onto, onto that ribosome. And to the right is just a list of these, and they're all involved in uh, protein translation. The other thing that we can do with this approach is that we can look very carefully at the different conformational changes of the large and small subunits that are associated with the translation cycle. Uh, basically, this is a molecular machine. The ribosome's got to open, close, it's got to let the mRNA through, it's got to let tRNA in there to create a polypeptide chain. Uh, by defining the swivel and rotation angles of the large and small subunits, you can actually identify um, what stage of the translocation cycle, the elongation cycle, you are at for any particular ribosome that we're seeing in the cell. Um, and this is just illustrated here. Um, the conformational, uh, the conformations uh, in terms of that swivel rotation angle are plotted out uh, to the far left. Um, we can see the, the uh, representation of all of the ribosomes that we're looking at in that sample and how they fit within this elongation cycle state map. And from that, we can uh, basically see a whole elongation cycle. We can fit all of these uh, different conformations of the ribosomes that we're seeing in the static image. Uh, we can see all of the different uh, states they're in. Now, given that we can see all the states that make up this elongation cycle, the next obvious thing is to try to stitch all these states together to potentially make a movie of protein translocation. And that's what we've done here. Uh, so here is a slice through uh, just, we have six different positions uh, that we can look at. Uh, this is just one position that we've sort of sliced through that ribosome. And we're now just playing all of the different conformations that the large and small subunits are engaging with uh, during the elongation cycle, during the cycle in which the polypeptide chain is being built uh, um, from that ribosome. Uh, you can also see the mRNA moving in. You can see the tRNAs uh, coming into these different sites. So with that, I want to. Uh, and by saying that we are poised to really interrogate organelles and the molecular machines that really enable them to uh, function at many different scales. Uh, and uh, it's a super exciting time uh, to be in this field as a result of it. These are new imaging technologies uh, that really uh, have only emerged, I would say, over the last uh, ten, uh, 20 years or so. 50, you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, thanks to efforts by a huge community of uh, technologists, uh, engineers, and uh, biologists. And with that, I want to thank all of my colleagues at Genelia who've been involved in this work, uh, my lab members who drove the individual biological uh, questions, but we've been generously supported by a huge number of uh, um, technologists at Genelia that have uh, made it possible to do these techniques. 
I also want to uh, thank our outside collaborators, Winfred Denk in particular for this high resolution template approach, uh, and uh, 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 Rob Singer and Craig Blackstone, who are our long-time collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lippincott-Schwartz, for being here with us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights. Your talk was outstanding and your uh, images were remarkable, so thank you. Now, we do have some, a few minutes to take some questions from the floor, so please step up to the microphones if you are able to do so, and, uh, please, and we will take some questions. Maybe we could have the lights turned up as well for the room. Yes, here we have a question over there. Okay. Hi, yeah. uh, wonderful talk, Peter Kapinski, Mayo Clinic. Um, I was wondering if you looked at um, the interactions between mitochondria and the nucleus, um, because I didn't see that on the graph. That what, that's one. And two, do you envision using the atomic imaging technology to look at chromatin or the mitochondrial respiratory complexes? Great. Um, so the first question is, mitochondria and the nuclear envelope. Um, definitely, you can, I mean, there is an association. I mean, the nuclear envelope is the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, but, you know, we didn't see a lot. I think it might be specific to particular cell types in particular tissues, like, you know, liver and other tissues. We're seeing a much higher frequency of interaction of mitochondria with that nuclear envelope. Um, but in the HeLa cell that I was showing, you didn't see a very frequency. The second question relates to <coughs> the use of this high resolution template matching to um, look at more sophisticated macromolecular machine, why well, we shouldn't say more sophisticated, but other machines like um, chromatin, what's happening in the chromatin or uh, the electron transport chain. Definitely, I think that's the future. Uh, it probably wouldn't be too hard in the, I mean, the problem with the nucleus is that we're gonna have to then use a, a focused ion beam to thin out the area of the nucleus where we can actually see. Because we're, we were looking at very remote, uh, a peripheral part of the cell that has about 200 nanometers thickness. As you go into the center of the cell, there's a lot more mass, so you wouldn't be able to get it unless you've shaved out uh, a small region. And you would have to do that, and it's possible to do, uh, to look at anything in the nucleus or anything in, my, in mitochondria. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for fantastic pictures and fantastic images. My name is Fatma Pedroza Domanov, and I work in Northern Sweden. I would like to know if you could tell us what kind of cells are the images collecting in? Yes, so most of these cells that I showed are tissue culture cells. Um, so HeLa, U2OS, um, PTK1, you know, NRK fibroblasts. Okay, and when you talked about the ALS and that you have a different uh, contact and uh, yeah. interaction with the mitochondria. What cells were you collecting in? So that those were cos seven cells. Okay, I can give you by just my curiosity. The yes. extraocular muscles, they are more resistant to ALS than the other muscles in the body. So it would be something to compare because in the same. Uh, Edamol, if you use my model yeah. or yeah. so, you can compare the two systems. Thank you. Very good, yeah. Now, I mean, actually, I mean, the, the ideal system would be neurons to look at this. Um, if you believe it starts in the neurons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, no. Yeah. So, um, when I was a graduate student, we used your book, 
same as the textbook. I think um, lots of people have various views. So I'm very happy to see your presentation here. My question is um, for the ER mitochondria contract uh, during the nutrient preparation, uh, it expands. Do you see difference in different cell type? Do you resort, uh, like observe any pattern? Whether there's more in some cell types versus less, we have not done it, that kind of detailed analysis at this point. Um, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I'm Sunny Lee from the University of Southern California. Um, I wonder if you can envision the same type um, technology can help to look into cell-to-cell -cell communication or you know cellular material transfer type of dynamic changes. Yeah. Oh, this this technology. Both the dynamic imaging and the structural imaging is very powerful for looking at cell-cell communication. Um, basically, you can image things moving from one cell to another. You can see extracellular vesicles if you want um, using this fast um, lattice-like sheet imaging. Um, yeah, I have examples of it from some other some work that we've done. So yeah, you can definitely see things budding off cells. You can see thin tubules, you know, interconnecting cells, these tunneling nanotubes. Um, the, using the FIBSIM reconstruction is something that we're currently very excited about in terms of really looking at the fine details of these, um, inter, you know, these uh, intercommunication hubs, if you will, between uh, these different cells. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Altran from the National Lung Institute. Uh, so I was wondering uh, how um, applicable these technologies are to what, like other different cell types. For example, the, uh, a lot of cells in the retina don't grow nicely on, in culture. Yeah. So is it possible to study, or use, for example, um, this live dynamic imaging for like tissues or? Absolutely. I mean the. The, you know, there's always issues with, you know, there being, if you go too deep in a tissue, you, you have scatter and you won't be able to see anything. Um, there are approaches to try to improve on that. I mean, you're not going to get super deep and look at dynamics unless you come in with some kind of a little <coughs> um, probe, but that's definitely on the horizon. I mean, it's, it's being done. Um, you can also open up, you know, little windows to visualize um, different different uh, tissues and the cells that comprise them in that dynamic fashion. So yeah, I totally. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do now at Chenelia is get out of um, tissue culture cells and move into a tissue context to address to sort of revisit everything that I just talked about, but now in cells that are in a tissue. When, sometimes when you when, when we culture uh, cells, in, um, you know, uh, they may some of these uh, fine processes may change, may not be necessary. Absolutely, the extent of contacts, the distribution of the organelles, absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Sh hi, I'm Stefan uh, from the University of Houston. Uh, thanks for this nice talk. I have one question about the formation of the eye exit sites. So you mentioned that they can be formed across the entire ER, right? And usually when you label like COP2 proteins, like cargo receptor, yeah. as I said before, for instance, they usually uh, appear as a very confined structure that is next to the golden. Um, does this represent the sort of final state where they have been delivered to the golden already? Uh, you're thinking about like P58, P58 as a cargo receptor? Such as SEC24. Such as what? Such as SEC24, for Okay, okay. The cargo receptor. Mm -hmm. so why, do you, why do you see a sort of confined structure next to the Golgi tissues and the ER exit sites from the cross the entire ER? Yeah, no, I, I, the ER exit sites can. So I think that there are two populations of ER exit sites, some that are really very close to where the Golgi is, um, and the ones that are further out, the ones that are further displayed across the surface of the ER 
are actually using microtubules to mm. convey the transport intermediates in. The ones that are right up next to the Golgi don't necessarily need to have microtubules for um, the uh, transfer of the material. And so that could be part of the explanation for why you see. And I, and I should have had that if you get rid of microtubules. Um, basically, all your exit sites are now right up next to a gold tee. And those gold tees are fragmented. Um, basically, the gold tees reforming at your exit sites um, for this local non microtubule dependent trafficking. If we can talk more about it, if you, sure. if you want. Yeah. We have a question over here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you so much. Deborah Villafranca from Dr. Di Polo at the University of Montreal. Beautiful talk. Um, I was wondering if you have the chance to look at fusion and fission of mitochondria related to actually those contact sites. Because in pathology, we know that actually there is a lot of fission and fusion. So I was wondering yeah. if you had the chance to look at that. Yeah. Um, we haven't, I would say we have not looked at that because the, um, yeah, I mean, I can ask Chris Obera, the postdoc who's been involved in this, whether he has seen any correlation. Um, he has not, <coughs> um, he has not in indicated that to me. Um, and, you know, when you do see this fission event, um, yeah, I, I don't, don't know is the answer, but it's a really good question. We have a question here. Yeah. Paul, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I wonder for this <coughs> technology, like imaging, they are good for the fixed cells or they're going to be for uncelled imaging? Maybe repeat that question. Uh, I wonder for these technologies, they are good for the fixed cells or they are good for the live cell? Which technology? Or the imaging. The dynamic imaging is for live cells. Live cells. Yeah. Um, we're fixing for the structural imaging. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I have another thing. For the live cell imaging, if you don't have a tag for the cells, you still can track other things. If you don't have the fluorescent protein tag, you could use dyes. There are dyes that allow you to look at lysosomes, ER, um, that you can you know, com you know, buy commercially. Um, they've been very helpful as well. Thank you. You could also look by DIC or phase contrast, and you can see some organelles under those conditions. I think we have another question. Yeah. There would be a Frank again. <laughs> I was wondering about the algorithm that you were talking about, the COEM uh, system that you are generating to analyze all the fit cell images. Uh, you are showing here only cells, but I'm wondering how uh, tissues could be also analyzed with that system. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, tissues can definitely be analyzed using that system. Um, we're doing that at Chenelia. And you know, one thing that I should probably have said uh, in, the, in the talk is that at Genelia, I mean, we realize that this technology is not available. I mean, not everybody can have this kind of technology in their university. So Genelia has an advanced imaging center that, that has HHMI funding to enable people from the outside to come to Genelia to use these microscopes um, to look at their particular questions. So everything that I talked about today you can come to Genelia and do it in the context of your particular question. All you need to do is write a short little proposal for this and submit it uh, to the Advanced Imaging Center at Genelia, and it will be reviewed. And if it's accepted, you will be able to, you'll be funded to come to Genelia to, to do the project. I was wondering because actually we did uh, fifth sem in the whole retina. Yeah. And I really feel what you were saying because we spent like many, many weeks just painting a single cell. Yes. So we, we would like to like do the whole thing, but it's a lot. So. Yeah. So there, there, um, you could come to, Gen actually you can talk to the scientists at Genelia right now to see whether your data could, 
they could help you interpret that data using some of their algorithms. It might be difficult based on the kind of staining that you did for your FibSim, but uh, they can definitely take a look at it. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please join us on Thursday at 4 p.m. here in the same room for our Arvo Alcon closing keynote lecture, which will be presented by Dr. Ivan Schwab. I think you'll really enjoy his talk. Over the next couple of days, please enjoy your time here in New Orleans at Arvo 2023. And with that, this session is closed. Thank you.